<laughs> so I would like to give a welcome to everyone that is joining us today. My name is Elsa Chain. I am the president and CEO of Pickler Lotsi USA. We're an all volunteer nonprofit organization. And I'm so delighted that you can be here today. It's really inspiring to see how many countries are present. Thank you so much. It's also very moving to be together for the same reason, our young children. More than ever, we're coming together with the most altruistic purpose, offering our babies a respectful upbringing. And we are most grateful. Today, our top international parenting experts will share a significant moment in their lives that opened up their paths regarding Dr. Pickler, Magda Gerber, and Rudolf Steiner. Afterwards, we will engage in dialogue with you, hoping to be able to answer your questions. This, I believe, will create an atmosphere of warmth and nurturance, and we sure need this at this time. I will share my personal experience after I introduce our speakers. Ute Strube attended the first ever Walder School in Stuttgart, and she worked with Emmy yeah. Pickler and also met Magda Gerber, and she also met Janet and Lisa. Ute is one of my best friends in the whole wide world and a master play expert. When she came to visit me last year, she stayed here for the summer, she asked to please sleep outdoors. And I said, what? <laughs> I don't have a bed outdoors. And what about the animals? We live in a canyon, so there are mountain lions and coyotes. <laughs> and she, you know what she said? Gently, she says, oh, they are more afraid of us than we are of them. So every morning she would wake up and I asked, how was it? Oh, lovely. Oh, wonderful. It was wonderful. And she felt invigorated. So now that's a true pickler baby. <laughs> Lisa Sunbury Gerber is an infant toddler specialist and Rye associate who studied with Magda Gerber at the original home of Rye in Silver Lake, California. And it was precisely there where I met Lisa in 2001 when she was a co-trainer of the Rye Foundation scores that I took at Magda Gerber's home. And I still remember her kindness in guiding us. And I was thinking, wow, how special it was to meet someone living with Magda Gerber. I was sort of starstruck. And in preparation for this webinar, I had the privilege of meeting your beautiful daughter, Lisa. Thank you for being here. That same year in 2001, I met Janet Lansbury while she was attending a parent infant class, also in Magda Gerber's home with her own baby her youngest. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful mother. And she is both inside and out. Janet is a best-selling author and her respectful parenting advice is quoted and shared by millions of readers worldwide. Thank you, Janet, for being here. We will lastly hear from Pia, founder of Beginning Well, whom we have partnered with to offer these webinars. Pia is a parenting counselor, author, and social entrepreneur. She attended a Waldorf school in Germany for 13 years and now serves on the board of WECAN, the Waldorf Early Childhood Association of North America, the same organization that published her book. They will all share a personal story that inspired them who they are now, supporting us during these challenging times. So here's my story. My mothering journey uh, that turned into a professional one began 21 years ago while pregnant with my son Leonardo and after reading Magda Gerber's and Emmy Pickler's books. Upon Leonardo's birth, I contacted the Rye associate in my area and that was Harry Gerbler who actually guided me in the direction of where I am today. So thank you Harry if you're watching. She directed me to Elizabeth Memel, Bebette, as my young son lovingly called her, and with whom we began parent-infant guidance classes at Rye. So when Leonardo was almost two and already verbal, I found him with scissors in hand, cutting our new 
shades in the living room. Of course, I was shocked and I didn't want to be reactive. So I just asked him, you know, what are you doing? And he responded, I had nothing to cut. And so I didn't want to yell at him or shame him. So I paused and like many of you do when you call Lisa and Janet <laughs> or Ute or Pia, I called Elizabeth Memel and asked her what I needed to do in this moment. And so she so wisely said to me, whose responsibility was it to have the scissors available? <laughs> well, mine, of course. So what a lesson, right? So my hands could have become violent in that moment and grabbing the scissors out of his hand. But instead, I offered Leonardo a simple open hand gesture to ask him for the scissors and assumed my responsibility in making sure that the space where he played was 100% safe. So how important are our hands? Dr. Pickler writes in her book, Peaceful Babies, Contented Mothers, hands are everything for the infant. The hands are the person, the world. That's in page 20 of the Sensory Awareness Bulletin. You can see all my, where I take my notes. <laughs> so with this simple gesture, I was able to bring up my son and create a cooperation between each other. He became the collaborator in his development and care, never experiencing violence, never, never being treated as an object, but rather an active partner during his care and growing into a loving young man who cares about humanity. So I am incredibly grateful for my teachers and seeing how this approach worked with my own son, I wanted to support other parents. Same reason Magda Gerber wanted to share what she had learned from Dr. Pickler. So I, would, I was very inspired to, to, to continue in, in her footsteps. So I'm very, very, very grateful to my mentors. And now I'm very excited to introduce you to one of my best friends and guides, Mrs. Ute Strube. Welcome, Ute. Hello. <laughs> Well, thank you very for, uh, much for this invitation. And uh, I just continue <laughs> the same, almost the same story as you told, because uh, now I begin in 1980, uh, Amy Picker gave a lecture in Los Angeles, probably invited by Magda Gerber. And uh, the title of the lecture was, um, Respect is key for baby's development. And I think with this title, you have already the message uh, she has brought to us in few uh, words. Um, year before, she gave a lecture in my hometown in Germany, in Freiburg. And um, here, uh, she was talking to parents and at the end of this lecture, uh, of course in this lecture she also was uh, talking about how to take something from a, a baby away or from a small child. But at the end of this lecture, she just said, if you only remember this gesture, if you want to take something away from a small child or a baby, that's enough. That's the beginning. You can forget all the other things I am, have mentioned in my lecture, but this you just remember. And this will change, will be the beginning of the change in uh, how you be with your child. So, this was, um, of course, uh, content of my workshops later. And um, another experiment um, I also uh, gave to my students was how to feel your face, how you would be 
would like to be touched in your face, around the eyes, around the nose, the cheeks, and then rub your mouth like this, as you would do to a baby with a bib, without thinking anything. But just do it yourself. First, this gentle touch, and then this wiping up the mouth. <laughs> and you will might feel how a baby or a small child feels if this is done all the time to him. And we don't, usually we don't think anything about it. And uh, once Emmy Pickler um, told me, you know, the uh, uh, work my um, nurses are, are doing is very uh, um, difficult. And I understand when they are desperate or even when they cry, and they can do this. But one thing they are not allowed to do, they can't be rough. And I asked her, well, what do you mean by rough? What is rough to you? And she did this to me. Yeah. Sometimes we do this. We just take a child and pull it somewhere. Yeah. Or she even showed me how we do it sometimes behind the head. Yeah? Just push it through a door. So there's another way how you can take a hand or an arm. Yeah. And I would uh, advise the audience, if uh, you have a partner at home, you can do this uh, to your partner or the, your partner to you. And you do the one hand this way and the other arm, you do it the soft way. And then you close your eyes and let your hand arm hang and just feel both of your arms of your hands, how do they feel? I guess you will be surprised how you feel the difference. At least I do this in all my seminars, so my students know the difference and just try it out. It might be worthwhile. Well, now I like to introduce Janet. Would you like to talk now? I would, Uta, thank you so much. That was beautiful, the way you described it. I could feel your respect in the whole way that you presented that. It was, was lovely. <laughs> and I want to thank Elsa and Pia and everyone for being here and Elsa and Pia for inviting me. It was such a lovely uh, surprise to be invited to come speak with you. And I'm, I'm honored and grateful and excited to be collaborating with you. So thank you for this opportunity. I wanna talk a little about another way of respecting children that I learned from Magda. And I was originally, Elsa, I was in Harry Grebler's class as well in the beginning. She was my first Rye teacher. And she saw how in love I was, deeply in love, with everything that was going on there and how I needed to know every single bit and try to do it exactly right and uh, being quite perfectionist in the beginning about this. And she encouraged me to go study with Magda and take her, uh, what they called then RI1, which is the foundations course. And I ended up studying with her for years and getting to work with her and one of the things that I was most struck by in her approach was her complete conviction in allowing children to feel whatever they're feeling 
acknowledging, accepting all of their authentic emotions, encouraging that authenticity. And she had this, uh, one of her, she made all these bold statements around this. She, she would say, an infant has a right to cry. And these things that were, were very, uh, they, they resonated with me, but they were so completely different from the way that I was raised, which was lovely. And I had a wonderful childhood and I'm, you know, certainly not abusive or anything like that. But uh, if I felt sad, that was okay. But everyone felt very, very sorry for me and pitied me. And that made me feel smaller and weaker and, and less capable. And then there were all these conflict feelings that I don't ever remember having, which tells me that I learned to remove those, and put those inside myself pretty quickly because I don't, I can't even remember a time when I disagreed with or was in conflict with my parents. And I know now that children need to do that. So to hear Magda standing up for uh, all feelings being acceptable, all desires being acceptable, while we also help children limit their behavior around those things, that was, uh, it was something that I, I realized this would have been so helpful for me uh, as a person to have this. And this isn't to say that all my problems that I've had in my life are due to that, but this feeling of confidence, this feeling of every part of me is acceptable and okay. I don't have to be ashamed that I feel a certain way. I feel the way I feel and it's all okay. Uh, that would have, I think given me much more confidence in my life. And so I was excited to try to give this to my children. And of course, it's a lot easier than it sounds. <laughs> it is pretty much impossible. And I'm still very challenged by this. And it's, I feel it is one of these, it's just so counterintuitive that we, well, I don't want to say we, but that I and most of the people I've ever, pretty much everyone I've ever come in contact with is uh, challenged by this um, constantly. And I've been practicing this for a very long time. And that's another reason I so love this topic because it's, I'm still working on it. Uh, when my child, when my children who are adults now are upset about something, I want to make it better. I want to fix it. I want to tell them they shouldn't feel what they feel. Uh, and it's just this drive that I think I'm always gonna have. And it, it comes up for me and I try to listen and then, and then uh, let it go and let my child have those feelings, which a lot of times is being rather silent. You know, we can acknowledge and then there's this, I call it braving the silence of, all right, I'm, that's it. I'm not gonna put a, something on afterwards that says, but you know, it's really fine, or da, 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 let me tie this up for you and end it. Um, I'm really gonna leave that open and leave that what people now call holding space, which I love. I love that expression, holding space. And what this does is it gives children resilience, it gives them confidence, it gives them authenticity. Another of my favorite Magda mm -hmm. expressions is, if you can learn to struggle, you can learn to live. This is informing me today at this moment and every day. I think for all of us, especially now, there are some people that have incredible struggles. I am not one of them right now. Uh, and, you know, I, feel I feel for them and I, I wish there was some way to help but I do know that it's it's okay to feel especially for our children to feel that in between to feel like I don't have the answers um, that I'm just putting one foot in the front of the other and that children know from day one ideally gradually that this does pass and we do find our way out 
and it does get better. Um, and then we know we can hold that in ourselves for the rest of our life that we had these struggles, you know, for an infant, it's sometimes they're, they're reaching. It seems to us that they're reaching for a toy and they're not even making a sound and we want to put it in their hand before they even make a sound. That's how, that's how challenging it is for us to allow the people we love to be uncomfortable. And it also, of course, goes back to ourselves. And like I said, for me, this has been a process that's been a mutual process. So it wasn't that I figured it out for myself and then I was able to give it to my children, but it almost came the other way where I learned that I want to give this gift to my children as painful as it is for me sometimes. And by doing so realized, well, hey, I need this too. I deserve this too. So it's, it's been a process and uh, I'm, it still comes into my daily work with parents because, you know, again, the feelings the, that we think that maybe we're allowing, they come in all these little mysterious boxes that we don't recognize sometimes. Uh, for example, I was, uh, in a parent and she said yes I allow my child to have all the feelings but they're I'm having a problem because they're very afraid to go to sleep right now so I'm laying with them I'm lying with them while they take a nap and at bedtime the whole time I can't even get up or they they wake up they need me to do this I don't want to be doing this and this is what I'm doing and and I was able to say well fear is another emotion that is a feeling that is safe for your child to have and for you to be open to maybe. And then from there, when we're not intimidated by the feeling and I've got to fix it, we can, we can find out what the details are. We can find out what our child is most afraid of, what the specifics are, and then maybe help them Together, we can come up with solutions. So it's not just saying you feel that you're stuck on your own, do that. But we've got to be open first. We've got to open the door first um, to be able to really help. So anyway, I could go on and on about this and everything else that I learned from Magda, and I won't. But um, I just find that it's the biggest challenge and uh, that it's, it comes into the conversation, every conversation I have with the parent, pretty much, because it's behind so many things, it's comfort mm -hmm. with discomfort mm -hmm. that we uh, can find. And now I want to introduce uh, wonderful Lisa Sunbury Gerber. She is someone I could not uh, live without. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. we, finish each other's sentences. In fact, maybe you could have been there finishing some of the sentences <laughs> I just had uh, better than I could. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here with me and I wanna hear from you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, I wanna say thank you to Elsa and to Pia for inviting, um, for inviting me and um, for putting this wonderful webinar together. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you in Utatu. Um, so in thinking about, um, I, I listening to each of you, and I want to reiterate, um, I came to know Magda as a, um, I was not a parent yet. I was young and I was a, an infant toddler teacher. And um, I was having a difficult time um, in, my, in my job um, as an infant teacher um, because um, I had a very difficult time listening to children cry or be unhappy. And so um, I was a teen teacher and it seemed like we spent most of our day, I spent most of my day, we spent most of our day um, putting out fires um, and, and trying to calm and soothe children. Um, and then there was a um, there was a conference, um, and it was the boss. I was living in Boston at the time, and it was the first ever conference that focused um, on infants and toddlers. And Diana Susskind 
was giving a, um, a workshop, which I attended, and she was introducing the Rye um, philosophy. And Magda had just published her first book, um, Your Self-Confident Baby. Um, literally that, like that week it had come, it had come out. And um, I remember after the conference going to um, several bookstores to try to find, um, to find, find the book and read it over the weekend, went into work on Monday. <laughs> and I want to, um, I want to go to LA. And, um, and so my, uh, the center that I worked, that I worked at, they, um, they said, well, find out more about when there's a training. And it happened that there was a training starting the next Friday in South Carolina. Um, and um, our, they, they sent me, um, with, along with another one of my colleagues, um, we drove all night from Boston to South Carolina to get there to begin the training. And it was life-changing for me. It was life-changing for me. Um, and I thanked my center by promptly going back and resigning and telling them I was moving to LA to study and work with Magda. Um, and um, I was fortunate to have that opportunity um, to, to actually live at, at Rye as the intern and work with her. Um, I think what she, what she offered, um, and then it was many years later um, that I became a parent, um, an adoptive parent to my to my niece um, many years later. In fact, she's, she's seven years old now. But, and, I'm, and I've been eternally grateful to have had all of those years of um, knowing about Rye, of practicing Rye um, before having my daughter um, because it was under very difficult circumstances. But what I got from Magda, um, there was any, and it's, it's what you were saying, Janet, um, there was this quality of presence that she had, that she offered um, to children, but that she offered to everyone. Um, and when she was, when she was um, with you, and um, it, she made you feel like you were, you were the most important, nothing, nothing and no one was more important than you were. When, when, um, when she was with you. And that's something that she, that she offered. And that all the feelings, and I had this experience in my, I, it was called Rye One Then, which is, it's now Rye Foundations. But I had this experience where we were talking, we were in a group and we were talking and I was very emotional about something. And I was trying to articulate something and everyone was trying to help me. Everyone, someone was handing me Kleenex and someone was trying to finish my sentence. And Magda said, Magda said, stop, I want to hear what she has to say. And, and it, I said, I said, I was struggling. I ever, then all eyes were on me and I was so uncomfortable because I was not, I hadn't had that experience in my life ever. Um, and Magda said to me, just take your time and, and it's okay that you're upset. You'll find what you want to say. And I want to hear it. And um, I had, I just, I had never had that experience in my life ever before. Um, and so then when I had my daughter, um, I had that, I had that. Um, and, and everyone commented on, um, in the very beginning, I was only um, able to spend an hour a week with her um, during these visits that we had um, surrounded by social workers. And it was, it was very uncomfortable. But um, when they put her into my arms, um, she immediately started um, talking to me. And everyone commented on it. She, she, just, started, she just started making sounds. And what, what um, I brought or tried to bring to, to her from the very beginning was that I, I'm here and I want to hear what you have to say. Um, and, um, and the and that has served us um, well to this day. As I, as I mentioned, she's seven years old now. But in, when I think about this time, the, the, pandi the pandemic and people in isolation and what, can, what message I can possibly bring um, that I've learned from, from Magda um, and from my studies and practice of Rai um, is, is also the, not, not only that, that quality of being presence, but as you said, Janet, that it's, it's, all, it's all okay, it's all acceptable, all feelings. 
and that when she cried um, and that she was her own person right right there from the get go right from the beginning and that when she cried there wasn't anything for me to do but to be there with her i didn't have to try to fix it i didn't have to shush her i didn't try to just to just to be there and and be present for that and the other thing is that um in this again in in this time is that we need we all need time together and time to occur and that's something that from the very beginning i cultivated and magda said that the time to be fully with um your child um is during the caregiving times and to have that slow 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 she used to say take the phone off the hook well now we now we've got our phones attached to us all the time right but she said take the phone off the hook and give the baby the message that i'm here with you I'm here for you um I, you know, I, nothing else is more important and we're going to do this together. Um, I'm inviting you, Uta, you said, you know, that, that I'm, I'm inviting you. Um, and this is something that we, we have this time together, which then if your child has that with you, um, then they're, they're full, their, their, their needs are met. Um, and then they are free to play. And then Elsa as you said, uh, creating that safe place, play space for them and, and then letting them be there, you know, um, letting them be and letting them play. And that, um, that's something that we, um, that we had and we are falling back on now here. Um, and this kind of the, the time that she, my girl still has um, two hours in her room every day after lunch that is, um, and it's not, a, it's not like you must go to your, no, this is like, this is our rhythm and there's times together, there's times apart. And when we do, when I do still, she's, um, you know, when we do meals, I'm fully present in there. I'm not doing on my phone or, or, you know, something else we're together and, and I'm present there for her when she has her bath, when she has, you know, when at the bedtime. Um, and so that I think has, um, it's saving us. Um, <laughs> it's saving us now, and it's, I think if it's something. And now I would um, I would like to um, pass um, the microphone to Pia. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all so much. I'm I'm deeply touched by what a gift to have to hear all those personal stories behind the faces of the so-called experts, right? To see that we are all human. And um, so I would like to try to give an answer on the question, what can we learn from the world of approach in difficult times like we are facing at the moment? And as Elsa said, I went to world of school in Germany from early childhood until the end of high school. And looking back at my 13 years of world of experience and after working in the field of world of early childhood education, I can say that the world of approach shaped me fundamentally in, in many ways. And I would like um, to focus with you on one essential topic, which is finding meaning in difficult times. And to begin, I would like to share with you a difficult time in my own life. My mother died after a long um, illness when I was 15 years old. And looking back, I was in a kind of trance, couldn't believe what had happened, although I had known intuitively that she would not live long. And at the funeral, all our friends family members and uh, acquaintances came to give me their sympathy. And honestly, I don't remember a lot of details, but I remember very clearly that I felt totally isolated and that everyone was lost in their own suffering and, and, and sadness. I felt their pain weighing, weighing on me. And suddenly my world of kindergarten teacher her name is Elke Maria Rischke, appeared from the crowd. I had not seen her for many years and she hugged me without words. And she hugged me in a way that I felt supported 
and carried by a deep power. That hug was like a ray of light that nourished me with, with energy. And it was she who wrote me a card sometime later saying that now my mother is always with me, that I don't have to rely on her physical presence anymore, that she can deeply care and support me in every part of my life from where she is right now. And she said something like, you are actually lucky. And honestly, that time I got really angry with her. I thought she had no idea what I was going through. So it took me a few years to understand what she meant, to discover and to perceive what she meant. And what she awakened in me is their perception and the perspective that there is no end of life. And as a world of teacher, she was deeply convinced that we come to this earth more than once, that we have an immortal spirit that lives on, and that we all come here with a calling. Rudolf Steiner, the founder of the world of approach, points out that each child chooses um, his or her family and the right in environment that he or she needs to develop according to his calling. And my kindergarten teacher also told me that I've been brave to pick this path, to choose these family circumstances. She also told me that there must be wonderful tasks coming in my life um, for which I will need the strength and compassion I'm developing through this so-called loss. So this totally new perspective helped me to overcome the loss of my mother, to develop power and motivation during the most difficult time of my life. Of course, it took me a while to get there. But through my kindergarten teacher's trust in my path, in what I will accomplish in my life, without any kind of pressure, I felt deeply appreciated and found the confidence and motivation to, to search for what's meaningful to me and choose where I want to use my strength for. And I think it is so important to have that experience to know someone who sees your potential to grow someone who experienced the wholeness of your being. And yesterday I got a Chinese poppy seed pot. I would like to share this with you. Can you all see it? Yes. And when I looked at this beautiful plant, I thought none of us would ever think, well, I have to tell the seeds how to develop so they can become beautiful puppy flowers. No, we would be all certain that of course each seed knows exactly what to do to unfold herself to her fullest, right? So I hope to give my daughter the same gift that my world of kindergarten teacher gave me, the gift of seeing her for who she truly is and the trust in her own in a wisdom to come to become herself that is within her. That's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Pia. Thank you everybody for sharing these beautiful stories. Yeah. Very, very, very moving. And now we would like to invite our, our participants to ask questions to our experts. We may have the answer, we may not, but we'd love to invite you to ask. We have some questions I have to put on my glasses. Need 
Okay, I have a question. Is there one aspect of the Rye approach or the Pickler pedagogy that you feel lends itself to speaking with children about the current world crises? How much do you think they can handle? Well, I can say uh, that this is, that the Rye approach is, and Pickler approach are about trust in the child. And this is an area where I believe we can trust children to ask what is bothering them and that we don't need to assume um, that we can really trust them to their own process of understanding. But I would always start with explaining in very honestly, this is another thing that we got from our mentors, that direct, honest, authentic approach that you can use with, and it's quite freeing to know we can use this with a baby. We can use this with an infant. We can be real with the tiniest person and tell them the truth in terms that we, seeing from our child's point of view, um, knowing our child as we do in terms that they can understand. And then also, I believe it's very important to share our own feelings, uh, especially if we have strong feelings or pervasive feelings about this. If we have anxiety, then to put it into words for our child so that they're not just because children are reading us so well and feeling, sensing what we're feeling, that to put it out there rather than have this mysterious, why is my parent upset and is this about me or who knows what a child might think. So we want to, to say, uh, I'm very worried about your grandmother or um, I am feeling uh, sad today or I'm a little afraid today. So, so sharing that with our child to put words to it. But yeah, I, I believe that this was very well taught to us uh, by these mentors. Thank you, Janet. Um, wonderful, wonderful answer. It makes me think of Ute. When would you feel comfortable sharing your experience when, as a little girl, you were living through World War II? What mm. was told to you, or what was your understanding that perhaps can help us as well during this the situation that we're living now? Well. Uh, I remember I was, um, how old was I, 39 years and up to 12, mm -hmm. yeah, between 9 and 12 during the war. And um, of course we had, uh, uh, um, how do you call it, this shooting from the... Um, Plane shooting. The plane from the, the planes, planes yes. yes and and we had Speak my sister and I we had to hide underneath the bushes um, but and uh, also there was bombing around our house and all the windows went out and uh, oh. but I never uh, was afraid because my parents um, in a wonderful way not uh, to pass anxiousness on to us. They uh, believed uh, so much in, well, if it will hit us, it hits, but uh, otherwise we get through this war. So they uh, didn't uh, pass anxiousness on to us. And uh, they were full of trust into destiny, in our destiny. And uh, so this was, um, well, gave us children a very safe feeling. 
And um, yeah, what what I think, um, to be honest with the feelings, as Janet said, is so important. And um, Ute, what you are saying, I'm asking myself the question, well, if I'm not someone who hasn't the trust in destiny, where shall I get the, the strength from? And um, I think even in in very daily situations where we are together with the family and we ask ourselves, what would happen if we lose now everything or someone gets sick? And just this, this hope or this perspective, we will find a solution together. We always will find a way um, which helps us to create the next step. It's a little bit like expressing our own emotions. We don't know the right answer yet, but we always will find um, solutions somehow. Or does it, does it make sense that the process is helpful? Yes, and you see, in, in every situation where there is uh, uh, being afraid of anxiousness, you can um, exaggerate it, but you can let it come down, calm down too, yeah? And this uh, calming down, the parents can try with themselves. And uh, our body gives us a function which is there in every moment and could calm us down mm -hmm. if we exhale just ah. you can feel how your shoulders how your shoulder blades everything goes down if you put your hands here and allow yourself ah, a sigh can you feel how your chest bone moves downwards and inwards and so it can move down to the floor and if you feel even your feet on the floor and not cramped like this yeah but really resting on the floor you can let this exhaling go down to the floor and the floor carries us there's a saying from Miro, the Spanish painter. The painter has to stand with his feet on the floor because the strength comes from the floor. So now in this difficult situation, the strength also comes from the floor right. and we can gain it. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's so fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I have, did, did you want to say something, Pia? Yeah, and the, the challenge to be in the moment, to be present, because once we are in the moment, yeah. we are not experiencing fear at the same time. Yeah. And I would suggest to go really from moment to moment rather than, oh, what's coming tomorrow? If we are fully present right here, right now, with the child, with the partner, or with ourselves, then there is no fear. And that, that's practice that's what we are here for right i mean um and we have to practice all each of us has to practice that again and again thank you pia there's a question that also came through the q a not from the chat it yes. says can you please address opposing parenting styles husband allows more mainstream parenting he tells me that Rye and conscious parenting puts too much trust in young humans and humanity in general. It's been stressful with our marriage. How can we practice respect without compromising our own parenting styles? Mm. Lovely question. <laughs> you know, Magda said um, respect for the world is when you let everyone be who they are. And um, I think that this applies, especially if we're all home together. I'm, I'm um, a single parent, so I don't have to, um, 
I don't, but I also don't have the uh, support of an, a partner. But, but I think, I think that letting your partner, spouse, husband be who they are and, and you, you practice. Um, and, you know, it's, and children are amazingly um, insightful, flexible, um, resilient, and they're able to adapt to, um, from a very young age to a different, and I, I worked with a family once as a nanny, and um, the mom didn't um, want to have the children to have um, TV exposure. And the dad, when he was um, with the children, they were both, they were lovely, hands-on um, parents, um, conscious parents, um, and, but they had differences in, in opinion with the, with the um, screen time. And so um, when mom was in charge, there wasn't. When dad was doing breakfast, TV was on, you know? And they, and they agreed to not interfere, not, not interfere with the other um, family dinners, when it was family dinners, the TV was off. That was that. That was the agreement. But if if it was one or the other parent caring for the children, um, to have that respect for each other and not to, um, and to try to give to try to give um, to say do it this way or this is the better way, that's only going to create um, friction. Your spouse, partner, um, husband has got to want this himself or herself. Um, and, and to try to force that on someone is not going to work. Um, and now would not be a good time. Um, to, I don't think if you're all stuck at home together, um, because of, of, um, social distance, distancing and, and, um, would not be a time to, um, decide, you know, that, oh, we're going to, I'm going to recruit my husband to a whole new way of, um, parenting. I love that answer, Lisa. Thank you very much. And I have one for Janet. It says, Janet. And this, this moved me very much as I'm reading this. It, it really moves me because I think, let me read it and then I'll give you what I think. Janet. What is the best way to change my perspective as a parent and remember to keep my patience? I am losing my patience a lot and so is my partner and we are doing a disservice to our child. I want to be a better parent and collaborate with her. What comes to me, it almost makes me, it moves me, almost makes me cry because I think you already are. Otherwise you wouldn't be here or you wouldn't be asking that. So I, before Janet gives you her answer, I just want to say that, um, that you already are. Janet, please. Um, I agree that you already are. And I think we can all relate to these feelings you're having right now. Um, I have felt them uh, for sure. And I, most parents I know have at one time or another. So the first step I would take is to have compassion for yourself. Normalize this for yourself. It's not a bad sign that you're a bad parent or going in a terrible direction or that your child is messed up somehow. None of that is true. Uh, as Lisa said, children are so resilient and if there is something going on now if you make some changes maybe your child will adapt readily and move on in a maybe in a healthier direction um i would look at uh i actually gave a list of of responsibilities that we tend to take on as parents that really don't belong to us and drain us and put us at the ed end of our rope. And these were all, these all came from Magda Gerber and probably most of them from Pickler as well. Uh, things like that we have to be entertaining our child, that we're putting energy there, that we have to be the one that makes the feelings better 
you know, what I was talking about in the beginning, what I was have been talking about, that it's not safe for my child to be feeling mad at me that, or sad that I don't want to be with them right now. I need to do these things. Have, being able to have those boundaries. Uh, the, uh, another one is well, now there's people uh, thinking they need to be their child's teacher now in a different way than they already are as a parent, which is their number one teacher, for sure. And that there's more, I have to somehow make learning happen for my child. That is uh, the basis of this approach that we're all talking about. These approaches are, are that your child is a self learner and if we provide the relationship and the environment, our child will, will learn the things they need to learn um, in these early years. And so those are some common responsibilities that, that we take on. I would look and see, am I, am I trying to take on these responsibilities? Am I expecting that things are gonna be smooth right now? They're not. This is a bumpy, rough time. And if you have more than one child, one of them will be crying or whining. Uh, even if you have one child, there's a good chance they will be sharing the uh, discomfort of today or the collective discomfort of their own personal feelings of I miss this or that or these this grief that we all have and I think that's underneath I love this article I read I can't remember where it was now but that basically under all of this maybe what you and your spouse are feeling your partner are feeling is grief it's we're all grieving losses right now a change in life and and we don't know the future uh, so it's confusing and it's scary. Um, so those are two things I would do. I would come, like, really look at your own feelings right now and see if you're finding ways to express them and, and feel the feelings that you have. Um, and also looking at responsibilities that you may be taking on that are actually make your life harder because then your child feels, continues to feel dependent on you for this. They, they really that are really their job to do and work better when they when they do does anybody else want to weigh in on that no <laughs> Okay, here's one. I'm sorry you're going through this. That's the other thing. Yeah. It will pass. <laughs> and you know what's lovely is I'm getting a lot of comments also that uh, people are feeling lucky to have found this tribe. So it's also lovely um, to feel part of the tribe. And I, I do want you all to know that we are here together collectively going, going through something together and also supporting each other. So you can always feel part of this tribe. And I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of your tribe. This one is a very good one for, because, well, let me read it before I say anything. Singing is the only way I can change my daughter's diaper. Would this be considered caregiving? She otherwise cries a lot. And I tell you something interesting. I visited the home that Pia and Ute created in Berlin for neglected and abused children. And as you know, both Pia and Ute come from the Waldorf background, but also Ute studied with Emmy Pickler. So I was expecting to see something more Pickler. However, I found the combination. And I remember when Ute received a newborn baby and she was with Frau Fischke, and very, without bouncing her or anything, I remember you sang to her Ute. So this is, this is a very good question because it talks about the different approaches. So who would like to answer this first? Would singing, would the, I can only, singing is the only way I can change my daughter's diaper. Would it, this be considered caregiving? She otherwise cries a lot. This is a very good, I love this question. 
I can, uh, uh, you know, when I had my son, Nikolai, who is now beside me and is uh, 60 years old now, and uh, I didn't Keeping know... you still his arm, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know anything about Pickler uh, at that time. So I died but him <laughs> and I was always singing um, something with Alexei. He, his name is Nikolai, but I was always singing about Alexei. So I was singing when I died but him and he grew up with it. <laughs> with, without Pickler. <laughs> well... Maybe you could sing, maybe she could sing a song um, about what she's doing. Yeah. Ah, lovely. <laughs> I am now taking your yeah. little leg. Right, engage it. That's, that's engage. very lovely. Inviting, yeah, inviting the baby to engage um, in the process. And I do think it's yeah. caregiving. I mean, you know different children respond to different things. But I, but I think if you really want to, um, you don't want to distract, right? Magda always said, we don't want to distract them. We want to invite their participation. So maybe if the singing is, um, is soothing to sing a little, I don't know why you're crying. I want to be with you, you know, whatever. I don't, <laughs> and you know what, my daughter, my daughter has always responded very well to um to singing um i th i think it would be very different if there was a, if you were like playing music or you know putting the putting something on the phone to show her um but she and and um she's very um my daughter is very dramatic um and as she um and 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 since she was an infant i always narrated everything for her um and and she narrates for herself now and I love to listen to her like I can hear her up she's in the room upstairs right now and I can and she's playing and I can hear her and she makes up these operas right and it's about what she's doing and what she's thinking and what she's feeling so yeah I I think singing is wonderful and fine and and maybe just try to try to sing about what you're doing and inviting her to sing along yeah, yeah. Yeah, lovely. And I would say, um, beside all those pedagogic approaches, Pickler, Rye, and Walder, um, it is so important that you you keep your creativity, right? That you find your own ways how to 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 bring things across, and perhaps how to make a combination of of everything. But the most important part is that you are authentic, and I think it's a lovely idea to start singing. So don't have too many doubts is this now not the appropriate way just go with um with what comes spontaneously to you to you right mm -hmm. you i remember learning it. yeah i remember learning that from from anna carlos mm -hmm. the director of the pickler house there's a difference between being a caregiver and being a mother i mean being a mother you make up for it with love it isn't about following a specific uh, choreography or something like that, but really for the mother to tap into her intuition and just let that love flow naturally. I love all these answers. I want to just add something because I guess yes, please. It's been my little rant on in this uh, webinar about the feelings that I would consider. First of all, everything you all have said, I agree with, and and there's nothing wrong with doing any of that. But I would also consider the feelings as a way of connecting because they are often the best, most authentic mm -hmm. and deep way of connecting with someone where you would be open to, well, what is it? You're saying, hmm, yeah, you don't like to be on your back maybe? Are you telling me that? Oh, wow, well, I hear you. So we are uh, proceeding and we may end up still singing, but we are not afraid of the feelings we're not coming from a place where like i gotta make this go away la 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 we're we're uh just we're connecting through it yeah. but we're still connecting with what mm -hmm. our child is communicating to us which is what crying is mm -hmm. thank you very much uh, this one pertains to the times now maybe not so much uh, in California, because I think our centers are closed, but 
This comes from my dear friend from Singapore, and her center is opened, but she says, due to COVID-19, our educators are required to put on their masks while caring for infants and toddlers in the center. And she observes that the children become fearful and confused when they were picked up by educators being covered with the mask. And during the diaper change or the bottle feeding, most babies were crying and yelling. And that's not a usual sight. I visited her center actually. Uh, and they were rejecting the care from the educator. So what can she do and how can they comfort these babies? Mm -hmm. I get chills. The only thing I can think of is to acknowledge the, uh, I mean, I don't have a good answer for that, but I would, I would say, wow, you're seeing this on my mouth and this is different. Usually I don't have this on my mouth. I'm using this to keep us safe. But yeah, that is strange to see this, isn't it? So, so putting it out there, putting the truth out there that it is different, it is strange, it is, you know, un, uh, it's connecting, it's... So uh, important to acknowledge, yeah. And I think, if, um, you know, and again, and I don't know if it's possible because of the regulations, but even to show the baby, it's you know, to take the mask briefly off and to say, I'm still, I'm still here because for little ones under the age of two, um, and this is why Halloween can be difficulty, right? They don't necessarily recognize that it's still the same person behind a, behind a mask or behind a, so to, so to say, you know, if, if they can, you know, say, acknowledge first, yes, this is different. You don't, you're not used to seeing me with a mask um, it might it might be scary, whatever. Um, no, I can show it. And I remember, you know, when I um, I had an experience with my daughter when um, I used to wear glasses, but only when I was reading, and I usually was only reading when she was napping. And this one day, and she was probably about eight nine months old, and she had been napping, and I had been reading, and I didn't take my glasses off before I went. Um, into to, she woke up from her nap and I went in to get her and um, and and she looked at me and she just she had a, the biggest reaction and I was like what what is wrong right and then I realized I had the glass and then you know I was able to I was able to show her oh it's you you haven't seen me in the glasses before it's still me you know here and and um, my my little one is particularly sensitive but I think. I, in, in a situation like that, that's all you can do is, is you know, acknowledge, yes, it's different. Um, it's still me here, you know, and talk, keep talking the baby through it. With a gentle tone of voice and, mm -hmm. yes. you know, one of our colleagues in Israel, this is very interesting. In Israel, we have created, or in Israel, they have created masks for these situations that are see-through around the mouth. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, and then also they recommend that there's video from the Santa Cruz Infant Toddler Center on their Facebook page where the, direct, the director shares about her mask and talks them through it briefly. So that's, that's a resource. I would uh, suggest that uh, the uh, child or baby also gets a mask so he can handle with it. And that when the mother, mother puts it on, he sees it. Not that she comes already with a mask, but she puts it on so he can see it. Yeah. And I wonder if that's something parents can do at home. And, and just a safety, infants, um, infants should never have masks or access to masks. Um, and, but for, um, in, in time thinking in play that toddlers, um, there can be maybe, you know, you have stuffed animals, you have maybe there can be, because children, children process things through play too. So I don't know if the dolls or the, or the, um, there can be little ones for the dolls and the, um, and the stuffed animals, you know, that the children can, um, can have available to them. Okay, here's the thing. It is now 115. 
<laughs> we were supposed to go for one hour. We started late because of the glitch with Facebook. And I apologize that that happened. Um, so what do, you, what do my panelists want to do? Because now I'm over your time and I really want to respect you um, and the commitment that I had made to you for an hour. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy and able to be here longer if if that works for everyone else. But I don't, you know, if others have to go, I respect that. I see we have so many questions. I'm looking at the questions, and we we have 24 here. I can see on my on on my end, and we've gotten to a few of them. I, I saw one question um, where someone asked if if they're very new to this um, uh, to to Rye, Pickler, Waldorf, how can they begin? What resources are, would be recommended? Um, I think that might be a, an important one to answer before we, before we go. I was thinking of posting on, once we share the video, to post some of the resources, your websites, the, the different websites that sell the, materi um, the reading material or videos. Mm -hmm. They're lovely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on those web, web pages, you, we all have links. So if you start your journey, um, then you will find the right material for, for you to get more information. Yes, and some of these questions, I think we've addressed them in previous webinars regarding independent play and self-nurturing, taking care of self. So if you're willing to watch those previous recordings, you will find some uh, wonderful answers to your questions with our uh, expert panelists that have participated in the past webinars. They want us to come back. <laughs> <laughs> come back and invite Harry Gerbler, since we both were influenced by her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, well, I tend to love to make things happen and I love challenges. So Elizabeth, <laughs> I, will, um, I will work on it. Um, okay, I think, any last one to close with? I saw a couple questions, of, I'm not seeing them right now, but uh, about, and I've got this question a lot, I've been hearing it a lot, um, about children missing their friends and missing mm -hmm. play dates um and the one parent that asked here i should try to go find it but she she was so beautiful in the way that she asked it because she said my child keeps saying this and is there more i can do to not to fix it but to uh help express that help him express that which i thought was just a beautiful way of seeing it um because mostly I know, I want to fix it, <laughs> um, but uh, we can't fix it. And it's a very, very appropriate feeling that we all have to some extent. And for a child to miss their friends, yeah, that's, a, again, a wonderful way we can, they can feel connected to us for us to just hold that space. And what does that feel like? And you know, who do you miss the most? And and then from that, maybe there is something, you know, maybe we can send them a letter, maybe we can go have an outdoor distance date. I mean, there may be solutions out of that, but I love that this parent wasn't jumping to the solution. She really wanted to help her child process that feeling. It's exactly, exactly the most healing thing to do and gives all the wonderful messages that we want our children to have. And I, I just want to add to that something that um, I've been asked about a lot, and it's right along those lines, Janet. And, and I want to caution people, and I know that you had the webinar, which was wonderful, um, Elsa, about um, the screen time. Really caution people, and especially with younger children, um, against these kinds of things that we're doing, the webinar that we're doing for, for adults, it, it can be very, um, it can be very wonderful and nurturing for young children. Um, and my, I know my daughter has had opportunities to participate um, with friends in these kind of Zoom meeting things and has refused. She said, it's just blah, 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 mom. It's not like really being with them. Mm -hmm. And 
And, um, mm-hmm. so, and, and for very young children too, and other, what I've observed is like the FaceTime kind of thing. It can be wonderful for the adults, but it, it very often for the young children, it's confusing. And it's like what Magda said about, she didn't like to have mirrors for in, in an environment for young children. And she said, and, and why? Because when they reach out, they touch a hard screen or a hard, you know, it's a mirror. It's not an, an image of reality. And when they reach out, they, they touch a, you know, a, something hard and cold. It's not a, it's not a person. And they don't yet children younger than two don't yet understand that what they're seeing Mm-hmm. there is not real so and I would I think it's really important to in to try to find ways that we can like but Janet you said I love what you said like we can write a letter we can have a phone call a phone call is mm-hmm. would actually a grandparent can record a herself reading a story for a child um mm-hmm. so many ways and and um I I just that's something that I um I, I just feel really, that's really important to, to reiterate. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, you can make a yeah. little parcel and, and put all uh, your treasures in which you want to give her as a gift. And, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and um, I think what I'm hearing so often that parents are very exhausted uh, at the moment, at the end of the day, and we are so used to um, to do so much during the day, particular with with little children. And Lisa, you mentioned that in our practice webinar as well that um, to reduce what we are doing, what we are offering, and there is no need to be scared. Oh, now my child is missing or not developing in the right way. Really, to um, to go back to little things and if it is just to go for a walk and discover some flowers or some trees and use this time really to reduce in a way less is more, right? I advise you to have little baskets for the little children with a, <laughs> a lid, yeah? So you can gather something while you go for a walk and they can gather pebbles or they can... Uh, gather some moss or some twigs or something yeah and at home you can arrange with these things gathering is wonderful for little children they love it yeah we don't have a yard here um we don't have a yard and out front we have a rock garden and some days we're not able to get out but ever to get out and go for a walk but we go out to the front and I took pictures and sent them to Diana Suskin because Diana's doing the um, stonework play. But I took pictures of my daughter spontaneously. She'll sit in the in the uh, rock garden and she builds these wonderful sculptures. And she made a bird's nest and she made she makes pictures of cats. So that that to, that going back to that trust in the child to be an initiator. And, and uh, we, don't have to, we don't have to plan something and come on, let's do this. Like letting it come, just taking her out there to the front and the stones are there and then letting her. And again, that's something that's been cultivated since, you know, since birth that I have cultivated with my daughter since birth. Um, we don't have to. Anything. Okay. I think one more or two more. Uta, uh, you and I were we refer to a simple gesture of the hand when you want something from the child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's thinking about her four-year-old. What would you do if the child says no and resisted to hand over the object? Well, it depends what kind of object object she has in her hands, but would you please uh, respond to that? Well, um, you can uh, give her an offer. Uh, you can put it on the table or you can choose another uh, place where you can put it. Yeah? And, uh, but if it's really a dangerous uh, object she has, uh, then uh, Amy Pickler also would say, well, uh, either you put it down here or I have to take it. Yeah? This is the last option we have. Yeah? But 
if you offer her different places and maybe she she uh, chooses a third one <laughs> and not the one you suggested yeah but then she puts it down <laughs> thank you okay does anybody have any closing thoughts because it's now 125 and i want to i want to leave you all hungry for more so that my panelists want to come back right pia <laughs> yeah. It's like Uta. We invited Uta once and now she's part of all of our webinars. Because so. because we think because we think it's so lovely to have um Granny Uta with us to have this this um quality of a of a yeah, wise wise white person. <laughs> yeah. Well, white, I, when she meant white, she meant her white hair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Alta. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm just deeply thankful that we um, meet each other in a way that it's not just this approach, this approach, this approach. That we really bring our wisdom together to share it with you and to um, to hear about your wisdom as well. So um, write us on Facebook about your experiences and your questions, so we can include them to our further work. And I think it's really the time to, to open boundaries because once we keep boundaries, there's always fear involved. And um, if we want to make changes, we have to, to work and cooperate together. So that's what I'm deeply thankful for. But Udi, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, I had the idea whether the children could uh, write down the plays, the games they have played in this time. And maybe the parents could write down what kind of arrangement they made for the children, inside or outside, and what they themselves discovered uh, for plays to play together with them. I think so they get active as well and not only we but they get active and we collect this and well we can think about what we do with this collection make a book or something yeah that's a great idea nothing yeah so lisa janet any closing thoughts i just have one thought I, I loved, Uda, I loved your uh, response about the taking the toy from the hand. I, um, I loved the way that you, you were so respectful and graceful in the way that you uh, recommended, recommended uh, uh, giving the choices. And, and it just reminded me also, you, you didn't say this word, but it was in your, uh, it was part of the way that you were, were presenting it that never underestimate the uh, power of politeness and, oh, could you please, would you please put this down mm -hmm. for me? Would you please, I, I think that's, it's so, it's such an integral part of this respectful, these respectful approaches that we're sharing. And uh, it's funny how we forget as parents to treat our child so politely. Mm -hmm. And you know, this was a saying of Amy Pickler, to be polite to a baby and to a small child. I heard it the first time, to be polite towards a child. In my childhood, we had to be polite to adults. Yeah, And so I was quite astonished when I heard it from her, to be polite to a baby. <laughs> I think Uta um, Magda used to say to treat the baby as an honored guest. And yeah. yeah. The baby, but, or, and, and that it, it starts with infants. Um, yeah. And then, and, but, and it goes on. Um, yeah, but to speak to the child with um, politeness, kindness, and respect, mm -hmm. and not to get into the uh, demanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Rudolf Steiner is saying to receive the child in reverence. So this is something similar, right? Yes, yeah. It reminds me of 
Janet Gonzalez Mena, when we would do presentations together, she would start with one slide that said, there are many paths to the top of the mountain. So here, the three of us, the five of us, are weaving together three, three different paths to get to the top of the mountain. So I think that's beautiful. And somebody to that regard said, so grateful for your personal sharing. Emmy, Magda, and Rudolf <laughs> would love to know this is happening globally. Such blessings yeah. they gave yeah. us. I love that's that. the wonderful last, last word. Yeah. Yeah. That's the last word. Yeah, yeah. So in honor of childhood, in honor of the great luminaries that have passed on their wisdom to us, in honor of our amazing panelists, we wish you a beautiful rest of your day, morning, evening, and look forward to seeing you again next time. This webinar will be posted by tomorrow. You will have it and we'll be able to share it with you. Thank you, Thank everybody. you all. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now I'm crying. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah. <It's> beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This was special. Thank you. Very special. Thank you all. Yeah. And I, I hope this you. was just the beginning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hope so. We're going to keep growing our boxes of panelists by the time the pandemic yeah. is over. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Take good care, everyone. Hi, yes. everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you for being there for bye -bye. us. Lots of love. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Everybody's going. <laughs> <laughs> Do less, enjoy more.